That's Thank right. You. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us in this uh, 12th episode of MEI's Defense Leadership Series. Uh, I'm Bilal Saab, I'm the Director of the uh, Defense and Security Program of the Institute. Uh, today's guest, despite his uh, affinities for the New York Giants, is uh, always an impeccable choice. Uh, and we're so honored to have him with us, uh, Richard Haas, President of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the Defense Leadership Series is a platform that we've been using since uh, last year, uh, June of last year, uh, to engage national security uh, and defense leaders from the United States and the Middle East. Uh, and we were fortunate to have the opportunity to inaugurate the uh, initiative uh, with a conversation with current CENTCOM commander, General Frank McKinsey. Uh, Richard really uh, doesn't need any introduction, so let me just highlight a couple of uh, things and I'll invite you to check out his full bio on our website and that of CFR. He doesn't just know the Middle East and know it very well. He's one of the most serious, uh, prominent and experienced uh, voices on US foreign policy. He held senior positions in the State Department in the Defense Department, the National Security Council. He's worked for four different administrations uh, Carter, Reagan, Bush, uh, Senior, Bush, Jr. And in his earlier years, he also worked in the Senate. Uh, Richard has received uh, prestigious awards for his uh, government service, and he's written and edited uh, 14 books on U.S. foreign policy and even one on management. Uh, his latest is called uh, The World, A Brief Introduction. My five-year-old daughter, Lillian uh, Richard, uh, asks me every single night uh, what I did during the day. And she says, did you talk about the world? And I'll say, yes, we I did. So if she asks me again tonight, you know, I'm going to tell her, hey, guess what? I actually talked to the guy today who wrote a book about the world. So, um, and I'm sure she's going to ask me if he started with the Jurassic era because she loves dinosaurs. So, but I have a wild guess that you didn't start with the Jurassic era. Um, we have a lot to talk about today, and I thank you, can't thank you enough, Richard, for agreeing to join us. Uh, but I've got one more person who would like to welcome you, and that's MEI President uh, Paul Salem. Uh, Paul, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Bilal, and uh, really it's a great honor, uh, Ambassador Hass, to have you with us today at MEI. Uh, we've always looked, and as everybody does, looks to the Council on Foreign Relations as kind of uh, not just the grandfather, but uh, the current gold standard of international foreign policy think tanks. Um, I worked myself at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which is also another sort of granddaddy of uh, international relations. Both institutions were born after the chaos of World War I, trying to bring order to the world. MEI, Brookings, a number of other institutions were born after World War II. Uh, we're celebrating our 75th uh, year uh, this year in 2021. I know you've already celebrated uh, your centennial, so it's it's great to have a CFR president, but it's also uh, wonderful to have a thinker, uh, an author uh, like yourself, Ambassador Haas, who's uh, really been a pioneer in thinking through uh, how we understand the recent past, the present, and how we look to the future, uh, and you give a good model of the philosopher king of what a think tank president should be, a good manager, but also uh, a, a thought leader. So thanks uh, for joining us. Thanks, Bilal, for organizing this. And I, I greatly look forward to the conversation. And I'll drop off into the background. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, OK, before we start, one quick uh, administrative note and one special thanks uh, from me. Uh, I want to remind everybody that I'm happy to take questions from the audience. So I'll be looking for those throughout the conversation. And I guess we can devote the last 15 minutes or so uh, for a Q&A. Uh, as far as special thanks, uh, this is an opportunity for me to express my deepest gratitude to CFR for taking me on as an International Affairs Fellow a couple of years ago and giving me the chance to really pursue a lifelong uh, goal, which is to serve in the U.S. government. So in case you're listening, uh, Janine, Victoria, thank you for your stewardship of the wonderful IAF program, which really was a turning point in my career. So with that, uh, any intro remarks, Richard, before we kick things off? Yep, just want to thank you and Paul for having me, and I look forward to the, uh, the conversation. Perfect. Okay, let's uh, begin at home, uh, Richard. You're a strong believer that foreign policy starts at home. Uh, just describe to us briefly the domestic environment uh, today politically and whether you see it constraining or enabling uh, President Joe Biden's uh, policies abroad, and not just in the Middle East, but elsewhere. Um, What's the sort of balance of power today in the legislative branch? Do you expect fierce opposition to uh, 
uh, uh, Biden's foreign policy from Republicans. So let's just start at home. Well, the balance of power when it comes to foreign policy has strongly favored the executive branch and the president really ever since World War II, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, you know, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote about the imperial presidency. It was his way of casting this in a, in a negative light. And you know, I think a lot of it depends upon whether you agree with what the president's doing or not. Do you see it as positive or, or, or not? But the president enjoys all sorts of advantages in the, both the design as well as the execution of foreign policy. The Constitution is very vague on the subject. Congress and in particular the Senate have very limited uh, says and even the says that they do have such as on treaty power is essentially has essentially been negated because virtually nothing's now formed uh, reached as a treaty. You call it something else and you can avoid that that sort of a, uh, uh, a process. So the balance of power significantly favors any president, not just uh, this one. President Trump used it, as you know, for example, to pull the United States out of all sorts of arrangements, to take U.S. troops out of all sorts of places. And President Biden is using it to put the United States back into some places and it's, uh, in one or two instances to keep troops there. So it, it, in that sense, the structural balance continues to favor strongly, not even a close call, the executive. I also think in some areas, there's more than a little uh, bipartisan overlap on issues like China. There's considerable overlap in the Middle East on the so-called Abraham Accords. I think there's considerable support. The USMCA, the US-Canada-Mexico trade pact was passed by, with congressional voice, both bipartisan, by institutional, bicameral uh, uh, support. US policy towards India has been gradually evolving and deepening uh, over many administrations, Democratic and, and Republican alike now for 25, 30 uh, years. So yeah, I could go on, but my point is simply that one, I think the two realities are one, executive primacy, two, some areas, not all, but some areas of overlap between the parties, obviously other areas not, we'll talk about Iran right. uh, and other such uh, uh, things. Afghanistan's actually interesting because there's disagreement within each party. Uh, and I think though the larger point coming back to your question, Bilal, though, is, is a third dimension, which is the domestic situation, I would argue, in this country is the worst I've ever seen. Uh -huh. uh, I first came to Washington, interestingly enough, in the summer of 1974, when I worked on the Hill for the first time. There was something going on called Watergate. Uh, I actually think this is far more significant, far worse what's going on now. And it raises real questions about the ability of American democracy to function. And it obviously, rather than enables, it undermines our ability to speak authoritatively as an advocate for the rule of law, democracy, human rights around the world. It makes it harder for us to be predictable and consistent, something that therefore weakens deterrence and undermines reassurance. So I actually think you know, we can talk about all the threats out there from China, to Iran, to North Korea, to Russia, to terrorists, what have you. But I actually think the, the biggest question mark, the biggest cloud hovering over America's role in the world right now is our domestic uncertainty. Right, right. Uh, this might be a personal question, Richard, but I think it relates to what you are just describing. Uh, several weeks ago, you wrote that you were leaving the Republican Party. Uh, could you tell us why? Well, I paraphrased at the time Ronald Reagan that I didn't feel I was leaving the party so much as the party left me. Right. I first became a Republican uh, back, I think it was 1980 or 81, right around the Reagan uh, transition. I had become more conservative living in England uh, in the 70s for, for, for six years. And I supported the uh, thrust of Republican foreign policy more than at that time what one was seeing in the Democratic foreign, foreign policy, which was much more uh, narrow and, and limited, uh, a modest government role in the economy. A, uh, a concern about uh, deficits and, and debt. Didn't agree with everything the Republicans uh, on certain social issues, but more, more often than not, I was far closer to the Republican Party. This Republican Party, one, is fundamentally different on almost every issue. Unilateralist and at times isolationist on, on foreign policy. It's also become a big spending uh, party, lost interest in controlling deficits and, and debt. 
lots of other areas I, I, I disagree with it in terms of uh, domestic uh, action and came to a head on January 6th, but I had actually left the party six months or so uh, before. And it wasn't just that I disagreed, but I had lost confidence that this Republican party would be willing and able to steer itself back into being a classically Berkey and conservative party. And to be to if the Republican Party is going to define itself as a populist party, if it's going to be unwilling to accept election results that it that it uh, dislikes, if it is going to be isolationist and or unilateralist in foreign policy, this is not the Republican Party I joined. Uh, so I reluctantly decided to uh, to leave it. But again, it's not something I, I did with. Uh, any satisfaction. Uh, right. And I, but I do think where the Republican Party is going is raise questions about the, the functioning of the two party system in this country. And again, I, I worry as a result yeah. about the future of American democracy. Yeah. Thank you for your candor. I, I can imagine this was a difficult decision for you. Okay. Uh, Middle East. 30 years ago, the United States assembled one of the largest coalitions in history to defend Saudi Arabia. And, um, to dislodge Iraqi forces from Kuwait. We did that because the Middle East mattered a great deal uh, to US interests. Uh, you were in that room uh, with President Bush and Brent Scowcroft discussing intervention. Uh, describe to us the mood and the conversation at the time. And after you do that, just tell us if you imagine us ever committing this much diplomatic capital and military force to the Middle East today. The decision at the time taken in uh, 1990 was in part for the reasons you said, to some extent, the decisions were Middle East specific. Things right. like uh, we didn't want to have Saddam Hussein control. You know, he began with his own oil, he, he grabbed Kuwaiti oil. And we thought if he got away with that, whether or not, what, whether or not he physically occupied Saudi Arabia and everywhere else, we thought he would have effective sway and influence over the availability of oil in the region. So that, that was part of it. We thought it was dangerous. And second of all, the, the larger context was this was taking place in the context of the end of the Cold War. The, uh, we didn't know what the next year of history was going to, how it was going to unfold. And there was tremendous concern that if this uh, aggression were, to use Mr. Bush's term, uh, allowed to stand, Right. this aggression against Kuwait, uh, it would set a terrible precedent. And others would take note and ultimately emulate Saddam Hussein. So the decision was made to resist what he did, to essentially from the get-go declare it unacceptable. And the only question was when and how it was going to be reversed, whether it was diplomatically, whether it was through sanctions, ultimately whether it was through uh, military force. That was the only question we had, the exact timing and the exact means. But very quickly, within several days of the uh, invasion, and I think it was August 2nd of 1990, by within one or two days, the president was 100 percent locked in right. on the need to reverse what uh, Saddam Hussein had done. The, the immediate challenge, though, was to make sure he didn't get, get into Saudi Arabia. And the first week of the uh, effort, once we had done things like secured assets. Uh, so this, the Iraqis could not loot Kuwaiti assets. We put a freeze on Iraqi assets. The whole idea was to get the Saudis to be willing to make a firm commitment, uh, the centerpiece of which was to accept American and coalition forces. Once that was done, we began to, as you know, we airlifted enormous numbers of forces uh, there. Those were you know, the most worrisome moments. We didn't know what the Saudis would do. We also didn't know whether Saddam Hussein might take advantage of those few days while the forces were being sent to the region. That was, his, uh, that was his best moment. If he wanted to create a further fait accompli, he had maybe a week to do it. Yeah. And the good news is he didn't do it. Uh, and so the, the long, slow process of building up, which provided our first, uh, you know, this is Operation Desert Shield, to prevent the aggression from going further. And then it provided a foundation to ultimately reverse it. And that process began in mid, uh, mid January of uh, what, 91. Uh, it was about that, about that straightforward. I mean, I'm happy to, to answer you know, any specifics, but it was a combination of the, the local, if you will, as well as the, the precedential and the global 
that led the president to feel very strong. Also, Brent Scowcroft felt uh, strongly, uh, Larry Eagleberg, Bob Gates, myself. It was, uh, uh, it, it was Dick Cheney. You know, I mean, look, uh, Jim Baker, you know, it, it was uh, everybody was on, on board very quickly. Yeah, well, I guess the point is to highlight the contrast between then and now. I mean, yeah. you yourself said okay. that we really had core interests and things have changed. I mean, just to say it very well, simply. But two things. One is uh, I do st I still believe we have interests in the Middle East. Right. We still have opposition to terrorism. We still have concerns about proliferation. We still have concerns about energy. And you know, for all the talk about alternatives, fossil fuels, including Middle Eastern fuels, are going to be central for the next several decades sure. to the uh, world economy. We have obvious concerns about uh, Israel. Uh, so. Uh, you know, if we were, but we wouldn't have to commit forces of the scale anymore, right. given modern weaponry. I also think what's different now is the last 30 years have happened. And one of the surprising and probably for future historians mystifying yeah. uh, developments of the past 30 years will be not Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I think people will say that was a classic uh, piece of a uh, Diplomacy using all the instruments of national security, U.S. leadership and so forth, not unilateralism, but leadership, coalition building and so forth. Uh, but will be what happened subsequently, uh, right. you know, centerpiece being the 2003 Iraq war, but any number of other decisions of either action or inaction. And I think what future historians will find baffling, to use a neutral word or not so neutral word, would be why, how was it that the United States at a time it enjoyed extraordinary advantage in the world, mm. extraordinary absolute power, extraordinary relative power, why did it decide to devote such a high percentage of its uh, calories, its resources, its attention and the like to the Middle East, right. which is what, four or 5% of the world's population, yeah. uh, other than Israel is not a modern uh, economy, at the time was not a venue of great power uh, rivalry or 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 interaction this will this will be quite properly a a question that will vex future historians about why this great power in a unique historical position essentially decided to again so devote itself yeah. to this region and the number of lives and dollars and hours it devoted that will be the mystery and coming to your question sorry to go on so long but I'll that's what now I think would make it impossible for the United States to think so big about the Middle East, because what we've done is, one, in some ways, distracted ourselves from other things around the world. But two, there's no domestic consensus anymore. There's no tolerance or appetite for the United States to get involved with a, a big in a big way in this part of the world. Yeah, I guess I wanted this question to set up the whole conversation, right? Just, just to see how we've you know sort of view the region differently and how some of our interests at least have uh, evolved. And, and as you said yourself, the approach therefore would be a different one from the one we used uh, in the past. Sure. Okay, so we have a new administration that signaled um, a new approach to the region one, at least that emphasizes as the president himself has mentioned values and uh, human rights uh, in putting diplomacy first uh, to resolve conflicts. Uh, the previous one uh, embraced a more transactional approach uh, that seemed to ignore uh, at least some of those things. Uh, just help us objectively evaluate um, President Trump's uh, Middle East policy. So not necessarily in every single issue, obviously, uh, but just more from a philosophical point of view. You know, what I'm trying to get at here is truly how different was it from uh, the policies of his predecessor? It was different in several ways. Uh, one was there were several examples of pulling U.S. troops back from the region. Obviously, in the context of uh, with the Kurds in, in in Syria. Secondly, and again, this is it was inconsistent. By that I mean, uh, in the in the world of diplomacy, you had the United States generally pull out of the Iran uh, nuclear deal, the 2015 JCPOA. You had the pursuit and the success with the Abraham Accords, but that focused on Sunni Israeli relations, nothing to do with the Palestinians, uh, ignored for the most part 
questions of human rights, rule of law, democracy, and so forth uh, in the region seem preoccupied with, as you call the transactional arrangements uh, above all with arms sales yeah. uh, with, with, with certain countries. So I was, I'm hard pressed to come up with a thread yeah. uh, to it, but it seemed to be a, a reluctance to get more involved militarily in terms of diplomacy, we were all over the place. Uh, and and let, me, let me actually rephrase the former. It was not just a reluctance to get more involved. It was a clear commitment to reduce our involvement militarily right. in, the, uh, in the region and the larger region, including Afghanistan. Diplomatically, the Abraham Accords were largely, were I think, the, uh, the one exception uh, to a, a disinterest in diplomacy, by and large, ignored human rights uh, rule of law, democracy, things essentially uncritical support of the government of uh, Israel, and it gave up any pretense of the honest uh, of the honest broker role. So uh, yeah. I, again, I can't quite fit it in the continuum. In some areas, it represented continuity; in other areas, uh, change. It was it was, a, it was an odd amalgam of, yep. of policies. Yeah, well, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, let's talk about Iran a little bit. Uh, the president's team have publicly stated they want to return to the negotiating table. Um, and reach a nuclear agreement. Um, would, would you yourself establish linkage uh, between several issues, the nuclear issue, the proxy network issue, and then the missile issue, or would you deal with those separately? And if you do separate them, uh, how would you involve you know, the regional partners? Because that was a concern of theirs in the past that they were not consulted. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm just guessing the regional security dialogue or how would that work? Well, lots of questions there. One is I would deal with these things separately. Right. It probably reflects my Cold War experience. We had arms control negotiations and agreements with the Soviets. We used other tools and other forms to deal with other dimensions of the Soviet threat, whether we use right. conventional forces, nuclear forces, whatever, dealing uh, diplomacy, whether it was in the Middle East or or Europe or arms sales or what have you. So the idea that you need to have a, a giant uh, diplomatic deal seems to me a recipe for getting nowhere. Got Plus it. there's urgency about the, the nuclear deal. So I think that would be a colossal mistake mm -hmm. to essentially try to wrap everything together. And link, and uh, I don't wanna see linkage used against us. I don't want the Iranians to feel that That's we're right. hungry for a nuclear deal and therefore they can act with impunity. I want just the opposite. If we feel we need to do things, whether to take the initiative or to respond to, to certain actions on their part, we should just do it as if the nuclear deal didn't exist. Yeah. If we want to negotiate on the nuclear front, and I'll come to that in a second, we should just do that. I, I, I believe we should essentially, as we used to say, every boat on its own bottom. And uh, no one, that's not meant to refer to the Persian Gulf. It's just, uh, just a, just, you know, I think we ought to see things as, as largely. Uh, distinct. Since you raised the question, I, I don't have much enthusiasm, to say the least, for getting back into the Iran nuclear deal. I didn't, I didn't have much enthusiasm for when it was negotiated. Right. I thought we uh, were too anxious to do it. I don't think uh, the idea that the, you would have the sunset provisions didn't make sense to me at the time, doesn't make sense to me now. Plus, the sunset provisions are that much closer now. So the idea that we would give up a lot of the sanctions in order to get back into a deal that would buy us a couple of years, and then we'd still face the challenge of the so-called longer, stronger uh, undertaking. Uh, I, I don't see why we would um, why we would go there because Iran could comply with the deal and get to the edge of nuclear weapons capability. That seems to me the worst of all possible world. They're in compliance, and uh, and then they constitute a significant threat. And by the way, just as an aside, right. Iran doesn't have to reach nuclear weapon status in order to trigger actions around the region, whether it's conventional military attacks or copycat nuclear programs. Right. Even getting close to that point, I believe, would uh, make a, an already dangerous Middle East that much more, uh, that much more uh, dangerous. That said, I think we'll probably be safe from ourselves. I don't think we're going to, I don't think it's highly likely the United States and Iran will be able to negotiate a, uh, a way back into the 2015 agreement. I think there's too many sanctions, too many questions about what would be relevant and what's not. 
Uh, we would obviously argue that a, a whole bunch of the sanctions were not nuclear deal related, therefore should not go down. Iranians wouldn't accept it. There's questions of timing and sequencing. You've got the Iranian uh, vote coming up in a couple of months. So I'm skeptical. Uh, what I would favor for the foreseeable future is simply an arrangement with Iran, an f- informal, tacit set of understandings. But yeah. we would have quiet diplomacy where we would say, uh, if you do X, Y, or Z, that would be uh, intolerable. You should know you will pay a terrible price. But if you avoid doing X, Y, and Z, or if you do A, B, and C, you could be rewarded. So you could be, there could be certain limited uh, lifting of, uh, or suspension of, uh, of sanctions. So I, I would go there. And I, sometimes formal agreements are the enemy of a diplomatic possibility. Because formal agreements have to be negotiated and then defended politically. Mm. Awfully tough in this country, awfully tough yeah. in Iran, and so forth. All of this, by the way, to get at your other part of your question, sure, we should be consulting with uh, the European players, the, the French, the British, the Germans. We should be talking to the regional countries who have a say in this, because it's, it's an important part of managing their uh, right. legitimate concerns, from right. Israel to Saudi Arabia to uh, to others, we obviously need to talk to the Chinese and Russians. I mean, the, the news that came out the other day about Chinese oil purchases, yep. it's one of the areas also where we need to think globally in our relationship with China. Uh, how much do we frontally uh, criticize China if, among other things, we need to think as China uh, as a significant player here, as well, say, as on North Korea? Uh, like it or not, they have tremendous influence over our interests in these two uh, non-proliferation uh, cases. So, but I would think the best way forward is some type of uh, informal approach. I think it's it's much more doable and politically manageable, and and ultimately probably more desirable yeah. than getting than, than trying to get either to re-enter the 2015 deal or try to get something longer, stronger nailed down. I just don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Let's talk about Afghanistan. I know the president is uh, facing a difficult decision uh, sometime soon. Um, mm-hmm. 1986, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev asked the Politburo uh, if the Soviet Union was going to leave or stay in Afghanistan forever, I guess. Three years later, they were gone. Uh, but only after losing more than 14,000 men and spending at least $50 billion. My old friend uh, Robin Wright has an excellent piece in uh, The New Yorker today on Afghanistan. If you haven't read it, uh, I would strongly urge you to. Uh, give it a read. If Biden withdraws the last U.S. troops from the country sometime this year, what do you think the consequences would be for both Afghanistan and the United States? Well, I hope he doesn't. Uh, interesting enough, the first foreign policy decision of the forty for the of the administration of the forty first president Bush, the father, was Afghanistan. The yeah. reason was we came into office in late January of eighty nine. The last Soviet soldier was due to depart and in fact did depart by February 15th. And we had to decide in a matter of days what would be our post-Soviet policy toward Afghanistan. That's just a little historical uh, footnote. And we look, we've been struggling with Afghanistan off and on for uh, these 30 years. Mm -hmm. In a funny sort of way, when we were against the Soviet presence helping the Mujahideen, that was in some ways the simplest era of US uh, Afghan policy. We've been dealing with the indirect and direct consequences of that now for for 30 years, and it's turned out to be uh, an awful lot more complicated. I think if we were to leave, the consequences for Afghanistan are pretty dire. Uh, I don't believe the government would would last long, or if it lasted, it would increasingly be reduced to a number of cities with a heavy footprint in the north, but it would lose control over any number of other cities and over almost all of the center and uh, south. I think the human rights and consequences for girls and women would be uh, horrific. Yeah. I think that groups like ISIS or the Islamic State or whatever they chose to call themselves in the future would set up shop again, no matter what the government says. Uh, and you know, to me, the only debate, so I don't think any of that is debatable. I think yeah. that's just a question of uh, how bad, how fast. Right. I think the only debate is, <clears throat> and I think it's a legitimate debate. I have my own views. I'm not saying I'm right, but I've got views, which is if the United States were to do this, yeah. How significant would the outcome I've just described be? Yep, exactly. How significant would it be for in terms of terrorism yep. reusing Afghanistan as a venue? Yep. And I would say potentially significant, but they could terrorists have the uh, option of using other real estate. Yep. 
Okay. And then the other half of the question is how significant would it be for U.S. credibility, our assurances to sure. others and so forth? And that's a legitimate debate and reasonable people. And I'm on the side saying we shouldn't do it uh, in large part because what our level of investment is in Afghanistan now is quite modest. Yeah. We're down to, what, 3,000 plus or minus troops. The level of uh, injuries and casualties has been extraordinarily low, given the limits to what we're doing there. The emphasis of what we should be doing is uh, providing long-term military and economic and diplomatic and uh, intelligence support. If we keep 3,000 Americans there, we can keep 8,000 or so uh, allied troops uh, there. So, uh, and just to be clear, I was against this agreement when the previous administration negotiated it. I'm against it now, and I hope this 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 administration uh, walks away from it. This is a this is an agreement not for peace. This is not an agreement for stability. This is not an agreement for making Afghanistan terrorism free. This is an agreement for American military withdrawal. Yeah. At virtually any cost, at any consequence. So I think it's a truly misguided agreement. Sorry, but yeah. I'll be blunt. And yeah. I believe that we should, uh, I mean, the Taliban can honor the agreement temporarily. We would leave. They don't have to give up their arms. They don't have to give up a civil war. Yeah. The day after we're all gone, they can do whatever they want, impressing their advance, which you know they would do. Yeah. So this is a truly, I think, ill-advised agreement. Yeah. Well, the more blunt you are, the better for this forum, at least. Um, so I know you you can't have a perfect answer on this or crystal ball, but do you think the level of concern would rise to pre-9-11 in terms of uh, terrorism? Well, again, you don't need Afghanistan for terrorism. Right. to happen. Uh, right. There's nothing unique about that chunk of real estate. There's probably several dozen other countries, yeah. including several in the part of the world that you know, this institution of yours is most uh, associated with. Yeah. So it just adds to it. I don't, think, I don't think Afghanistan necessarily qualitatively changes it unless Pakistan plays a certain role. Sure. But short of that, uh, no, I, uh, I think it simply adds to a already extant uh, yeah. threat. Yeah, got it. You wrote in a project syndicate that we need a realist reset for our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, first of all, were you in favor of releasing that intel document implicating uh, the crown prince in the murder of uh, Fosirji? Uh, what do you think uh, we accomplished by was... doing that? Uh... <laughs> well, we, on one hand, we made life tougher for ourselves because once you released it, it built up expectations that your response would be commensurate with what was released. Right. And we obviously chose not to do that. And I think that was the wise decision. All things being equal, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure you had a release in given Congress. Um, I think there's something to be said for getting it out there. It's a way of uh, stigmatizing, of uh, the, so the Saudi leadership. They did a horrific thing. They ought to, uh, it ought to be known. They ought to uh, bear the responsibility. I just think it, the release made the diplomatic aftermath more complicated because what we're basically, and it's, by the way, it's akin to challenging, to calling the Chinese out on genocide and then meeting with the Chinese, calling Putin the killer, then sure. having summits with Putin. And here's the Saudi equivalent. Yeah. You find them essentially guilty, complicit of murder. Yeah. And then, but you say, but the relationship's not going to change much. So in all of these cases, yeah. what I think the administration is doing is setting, it's, it's making its own life more difficult. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I am saying that they've made life more difficult for themselves. What about this realist uh, reset that you talk about? Look, Saudi Arabia matters. Uh, it matters. It's the most, it's for, you know, you don't need me to tell you why, uh, whether the energy space, the counterterrorism space, Iran, I think the idea that Saudi Arabia could ultimately find its way to joining the Abraham Accords is not inconceivable. Yeah. And it could even jumpstart the Palestinian, uh, uh, a peace process between Palestinians and Israel, Israelis. So my view is uh, use this, leverage it, work with it. Saudi Arabia is a reality. Uh, you yeah. can't, to use President, or then candidate Biden's word, I don't think we can treat Saudi Arabia as a pariah. It's a reality. Uh, what we want to do is shape Saudi Arabia. We want to get them to get to let political activists out of prison, right. to introduce economic and political reforms uh, uh, at home, to be a partner vis-a-vis -vis Iran, a partner vis-a-vis -vis terrorism, to get the hell 
out of Yemen uh, to do lots of things. So my view is Saudis did this and let's, we have to work with Saudi Arabia, but let's, let's where we can uh, move Saudi Arabia in a direction that we believe is far more constructive. You mentioned the Abraham Accords. How big of a deal are those? Well, I think, I think they're a deal uh, in the sense that uh, any normalization between Israel and its neighbors, its Sunni neighbors, is significant. They're okay. built on the Jordanian and Egyptian uh, precedent, but it, they're not trans transformational. Okay. And they did not involve the Palestinians uh, other than the UAE putting uh, in the deep freeze the annexation process, and it didn't involve Saudi Arabia. Now, so right. the real question is going forward, can you bring Saudi Arabia in? Can you unfreeze the Israeli-Palestinian issue? Then it, then it has the, then it's, the, then it's into big deal uh, mm -hmm. territory. Right now it's in deal territory, not big deal territory. Okay. Um, we're now placing Israel in CENTCOM, uh, Richard, as you very well know. Uh, was that the right decision? Uh, do you think it would uh, affect our efforts to allocate more resources to this new priority of ours in the Indo-Pacific? I was involved in the creation of CENTCOM. Uh, when I was at the Pentagon in 79 and 80, yep. you had the two great geopolitical events or the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that you alluded to, and the other was the revolution in Iran. Yep. It was against that backdrop that the United States created the rapid deployment force, the rapid deployment joint task force, ultimately became central command a couple mm -hmm. of years later. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Israel should have been in central command from the get-go. The only reason Israel wasn't in central command is that people were worried that Arab political military cooperation would be much harder to come by if Israelis were, were there. Uh, sure. that is, and I, I can't decide to what extent we were reflecting that reality, to what extent American uh, military and civilian people were almost too cautious. Mm. Fact is, though, you had to have all sorts of uh, de facto coordination between Israel and several Arab countries. We had extensive coordination during the, uh, the Gulf War in 1991 uh, and so forth. So, uh, again, geographically, militarily, every other way, to ha not to have Israel in CENTCOM makes absolutely no sense. So to me, it was simply a diplomatic packaging question. Uh, but... But, you know, better late than never that Israel's involved, formally involved, but it has been involved in many ways for a long time. But, but just help us clarify the opportunities there. Uh, what do you see, uh, at least on the Arab-Israeli sort of security cooperation uh, front? Is there a ceiling there or we should be excited about it or what? Well, it's hard to generalize. A lot depends upon the Arab world. I think for a lot of Arab countries, the biggest challenges are internal. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, Iran's a significant external channel challenge, I get it. But for a lot of the Arab world, the Arab world that we care about in the positive sense, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, Lebanese and others, the real problem, I would argue, is internal. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got governments that are, that are stressed. I'll use a, a, gener a generous word. Then you've got the, the failed states, the conflict defined states, Yemen, Syria, Libya, which is a different set of uh, problems those places are consumed by what's going on with uh in their borders you've got the, the the old gcc countries which are preoccupied especially you know not just with yemen but also with uh iran and i think there's potential coordination or cooperation on uh, on iran this potential coordination and cooperation against various iranian-backed militia against various terrorist groups so i think there's 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 real uh, possibility. I mean, that's one of the real changes in the region. Again, you know more about it than I do, but you know, there was an era, I don't know if it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever that, probably four, closer to 40 years ago, where for Arab governments, they get up in the morning and the principal strategic and political preoccupation would be Israel. But I think 30 years ago, it was Saddam Hussein. Yeah. People were not talking about Israelis when Saddam Hussein was doing his thing. Palestinians didn't help their own cause much when they were cheering for Saddam Hussein. More recent years, it's uh, Israel or various terrorist groups that are just as happy to kill Sunni Arab leaders as they are anybody uh, else. So you know, Israel is simply now one of many concerns. And for a lot of them, it's far, far, far down the uh, list. Plus, the Palestinians have worn out their welcome in many ways. So I, I think that you, to look at the Middle East through the lens or prism of the Israeli-Palestinian issue is way, it's probably four decades at least out of date. Yeah. 
Richard, I don't expect you to know the ins and outs of every single crisis in the region. So to the extent that you are tracking this one, uh, I got a couple of questions on Lebanon. I promise you, it's not me. It's people from the audience. I'm just not. I'm going to warn you in advance. Uh, it's been years since I worked on it closely. I was intimately involved in it in the 80s in particular when I was at uh, I had some responsibility for it. Uh, that yeah. with the U.S. presence in Lebanon. Yeah. I have not kept up as much as I should have. So let me just warn you in advance below. Okay, big picture stuff then. Uh, country's falling apart, and you've seen that before, obviously. Uh, perhaps this time around, it's, it could be worse in terms of total financial collapse. Um, sure. Just look at the broader implications of this in terms of the expansion of Iranian power in the country and what that might entail for U.S. interests. So just perhaps you can discuss that. No, look, it's true. I mean, you've got, look, Lebanon has always faced the the realities of its internal divisions, the demographics, the politics, and so forth. Uh, now, on top of that, you, you, you've got year, decades of weak central authority, uh, all sorts of non-authorized, or, but, of non-authorized uh, forces, external involvement. Now you've got the economic problems on top of it. So... Again, it's interesting. So much of the world, people like me, you deal with strong countries. You know, we we worry about China. We worry about. Uh, I'll get to those in a second. Russia. <laughs> yeah, but what's so interesting, and even in the Middle East, we worry about Iran or whatever. Well, you know, Lebanon is much more of a a category of, of weak states where central authorities can't perform right. the functions right. that sovereign central authorities are meant to perform. So the the question is, what happens? You know, and I don't I don't have a crystal ball. But Iran has clearly pressed its, uh, you know, whether it's Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Iran has today, if you compared it to what, say, 10 years ago, yeah. Iran has dramatically upped its influence and, it, and its presence, whether it's Iranian presence or Iranian back presence in all three countries. Yeah. And that's that's a fact of life. And, you know, Lebanon, that process was, has been underway for decades. Sure. In Iraq and Syria, it was really much more of. Uh, I mean, the Iraq phenomenon was an outcome of the 2003 Iraq war, and the Syrian one was an, uh, uh, largely an outgrowth, more than anything else, of the Arab Spring and what happened after that. So it, 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 three different dynamics, three different time uh, spans. But the bottom line is that the Iranian sway has increased in all three. And if you add them together and you look at a map, uh, you don't have to be a cartographer to see the, uh, you know, the, the, co the connections and the potential consequences. Yeah. Um, one of the audience members is asking you about a reset, not with Saudi Arabia, but with Turkey. So do you think that merits also a reset with another big country? I don't think it's possible. I don't think U.S.-Turkish relations are likely to be reset so long as uh, Mr. Erdogan is president of Turkey. Okay. Uh, I just don't see it as uh, as likely. I won't say it's possible. I just don't see it as likely. And so I think in you know Turkey right now is technically an ally, but it's not in reality a partner. It's yeah. too close to the Russians. It's pursuing a narrow, if you will, Turkish first foreign policy that doesn't seem to defer very much to us or anybody else. Yeah. Whether it's in the Eastern Med or Syria or you 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 name it. So I don't, I would say, well, so long as Mr. Erdogan's in power, I would look to, for ways to reduce our dependence on him in Turkey. I would look for ways to find other military facilities that are, uh, we can count on more in a crisis. And perhaps after Mr. Erdogan goes, U.S.-Turkish relations can revive. So I would keep connections if we can, using IMET and other type programs to various institutions and rising professionals in Turkey. But again, I am quite uh, bearish on U.S.-Turkish relations so long as uh, he occupies the uh, office of the presidency. I should look it up, but uh, let me ask you, uh, is there a clause in NATO where it's clear what is the process to kick out a member? I'm not saying we should. No, sir. Is there? No, sir. There isn't. There's a... Uh... Was it Sartre? I think it was who wrote a play called a book called No Exit. That's NATO. <laughs> oh wow! Regardless of behavior, that's interesting. Yeah. Do you think that's something that should be adjusted, rectified, or? Well, again, the question is: Could you introduce it? You know, would you have to get unanimity? Could you? Uh, 
it's just a real problem. I think with, with, with a country like Turkey, you end up with what uh, we used to call workarounds. Right. But it's awkward. Uh, but I think there's legitimate questions about whether, for example, look with Turkey's purchase of the That's air defense system. Yeah. Why would you? Uh, why would you share certain types of intelligence with Turkey? Why would you? Why would? Yeah, we've obviously had real questions about you know, the, the fighter aircraft providing those. I think there's real questions about whether you can trust Turkey and what. And more important, being an ally is about expectation. Yeah. When you when a country when countries are allies, they they build in expectations or assumptions about the availability of the other in yes. certain types of situations. We have to suspend any of those assumptions. Uh, so no, I would be very careful in our relations with Turkey, and I would essentially work work around wherever possible. Okay. Uh, obviously, we've turned our attention, at least we've been trying to turn our attention over the past few years to China. Uh, so let's just try to limit the conversation to China in the Middle East. Uh, what's your own view of the limits of Chinese power in the region? Is it its military presence? Is it its lack of experience with the region? Is it its own culture? Because uh, I'm trying to really evaluate to what extent we should be worried about Chinese influence in the region. I'd say two things. One, if you're if you're Xi Jinping, the Middle East is not your pr priority. You know, you're, you're focused on Taiwan, South China Sea, the uh, continued role of the uh, Communist Party, uh, relations with the United States. You know, Middle East is far down the list. And I think consistent with the Belt and Road Initiative and so forth, a lot of it is geoeconomic. It's about en locking in energy resources and so forth. But the, the, the Chinese are, I think, are not looking to have tremendous influence in the Middle East. What they like is a Middle East that's roughly stable so they can continue to get what it, what it is they want and need out of the, uh, out of the uh, region. And right. so when I think of challenges in the Middle East, China for me is way, way, way down the list. Uh, so again, uh, I don't think the Middle East is that important to China, and I don't think China is that important to the Middle East. But as we mentioned before, things like Iran's a perfect example. China conducts essentially everywhere what I would call an amoral foreign policy. It just cares about what it access to this mineral or access to this energy source or access to this port, what have you. And that's their approach. So in the case of Iran, they could be you know, exceedingly unhelpful. By, in the case of Venezuela, they can be quite uh, unhelpful. What they do or don't do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, which is different. North Korea, you've got, again, because it's so close, it's because of borders on China, it's a strategic concern. I think the Middle East, though, is not in that sense strategic for China as an area of Chinese influence or outreach. What matters about the Middle East for China is assurance about energy supplies. Yeah. I mean, that's a big deal itself, right? Still. It's a significant deal. Yeah. And it's different. But China, look, Chinese foreign policy, one of the many, many ways, again, not at the top of us, but one of the ways one can understand China is to, and it's actually consistent with China, let me take a step back, with Chinese foreign policy for decades now. One function of foreign policy has been not to promote Chinese influence around the world, but to use foreign policy to strengthen the party and the state, to Got strengthen it. economic uh, activity and so forth. So if you understand it that way, then chi what China does in the Middle East makes sense. It's again, amoral and the purpose of it is to serve the interest of the country, in this case, the economic, economic interests, which are necessary in order to maintain political stability. So if I understand correctly what you're saying, I don't think the Chinese would be interested in expanding their military presence beyond that small base in Djibouti, right? I don't see it unless there was some specific tie to this or that resource. But no, they're not. This is the, China in the Middle East is qualitatively different than Russia in the Middle East. Uh -huh. Let me put Let's it that way. Uh, well, if one, you know, I think for Russia, the Middle East, first of all, it's a lot closer than it is to China. And yeah. Russia has a historical role there. And it's psychologically, politically, strategically more significant to uh, Russia. I think for Mr. Putin, the re-entry to the Middle East, getting what he's doing in Syria was psychologically and politically and strategically a big deal. If you okay. think about one of the great humiliations yeah. of Soviet foreign policy was when they got tossed uh, by Sadat. Yeah. Uh, Egypt was their, you know, their principal uh, investment. Or Iraq, to some extent, was uh, their other principal. So they, you know, they've been 
they lost badly ultimately in both. Yeah. And the idea of reentry, I think, has been for somebody like Putin has been a significant uh, development, and it's allowed the Russians, at a time the United States was pulling back, it allowed the Russians to lean in, to lean forward, and to eventually say we can be a, a good partner in this part of the world. We don't, you know, unlike the Americans who want to get going, uh, you know, basically dial down their presence. We Russians are prepared to stay, and by the way. We're prepared to do what it takes to help you. That was a pretty big message in Syria. Yeah. What is it about Putin that makes it so hard for us to um, deal with him? I mean, we signed agreements with some of the most uncompromising ideological Soviet leaders. Why is it so different with him? Well, we just signed an agreement with him. We just extended the New START agreement. Look, my view is, uh, you know, we look. I've never seen diplomacy as a favor. I see it as a tool. Sure. So I believe we should meet with Putin. We should deal with Lavrov, deal with Russia. Uh, we don't pay a price for that. It doesn't cost us to show them some respect, to work with them where we can, whether in a, I mean, I don't think, for example, I don't think the Russians want Iran to have nuclear weapons. I, if I were a Russian strategist, I wouldn't want that. Uh, for lots of reasons, given their own Islamic population, given Iran's proximity to Russia. So I don't rule out the possibility that there could be some overlap in our interests. In other areas, I have no illusions about Russia, about crushing domestic dissent, what they're doing in Ukraine, Georgia, what they could do elsewhere in Europe, what they're doing in Syria, what they're doing in North Korea. So I think in you know, 90% of the situations, the United States and Russia at cross purposes, Mr. Putin gets up in the morning, the Biden administration is his worst nightmare in some ways because it represents a, a democratic, small D America, rule of law, human rights. You know, uh, it's the same reason they opposed Hillary Clinton. No enthusiasm for Joe Biden and this this kind of an American foreign policy. He sees it as a threat to his rule. Yeah. And you know what? He may be right. And so I just think that the United States and Russia, it's a different relationship than the United States and China, but the United States and Russia it's more damage limiting or, or crisis avoidance. Could there be one or two areas of potential cooperation? Sure. But, the, but basically it's the avoidance of negatives. China's a more complicated relationship with, with uh, potentially, emphasize the word potentially, more upside. The analysis you shared with me on uh, Afghanistan do some parts of it apply also to Iraq in the event that we decide also to completely withdraw? Or is it a completely different well, situation? It's a, it's a fair question. I think the difference is if you leave Afghanistan, you're turning it over to the Taliban and probably some terrorist groups and, and real mayhem. Iraq, we've already increased Iranian influence. I think a, a winding down of American presence in Iraq would both increase Iranian influence. And again, I, I think your question is a good one. It would increase uh, disarray within the borders of the country. There'd probably be more terrorism, more factionalism uh, fighting. And again, it's a small American presence. You know, I think these are all complicated situations. The reasons we should stay in these places at a low level, I would say, is not because of the sunk costs. It's not because, I, don't, I never like the argument. Well, we've, we've sacrificed so much, we therefore need to sacrifice, need to commit more. I don't think that's a good argument. That is a well, that's the argument, argument of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I think the stronger argument is if we were to leave, the co like I said, the costs of staying are less than the costs of, of leaving at this point moving forward. I think that's the calculation. Right. We've done what we've done. We've spent what we've spent. Decisions right. we've made, we've made. And I'd say the same about Iraq. The issue shouldn't be we can't have I, you know, the optimal policy now because of the fact we had suboptimal policy before. I don't think that's a way you can conduct foreign policy. I right. think the answer is, what is the optimal policy moving forward? That's the only question we should be asking. Okay. We got two more questions, Richard, since we're uh, almost running out of time. I'll take one from the audience, uh, which is um, the role of the EU, or let's just say Europeans uh, in the Middle East, as we at least try to draw down, somebody else is going to have to step up, whether it's the regional partners or the Europeans. Mm -hmm. What kind of a role do you expect your Europeans to play that would be instrumental? I don't. Uh, they've got Europeans are preoccupied with Europe. They're preoccupied with domestic matters, 
you know, the real concern increasingly in the Middle East is less the Middle East qua the Middle East than the Middle East as a source of immigrants. Right. So Italy has a special interest in Libya, France, and several places and so forth. So, and, and Turkey therefore takes an outsized significance given that it's in many ways the, the gateway. But I, I don't see the Europeans having either the desire or more important, the means to use your word, to play an instrumental role yeah. in the region, except very selectively, particularly in some former colonial areas. There might be some things the French or the Italians could do. But by and large, like one of the lessons of all these wars in recent years in Asia and the Middle East and so forth is the advantage that locals have. They're there. Sure. For them, it's, you know, for what, for, your, for Europeans or Americans, you know, to use a cynical cliche, for us, it's a square on the chessboard. For them, it's the chessboard. Right. It's fundamentally different calculations. So I, I just don't think Europeans have the wherewithal, particularly at a given all that's going on in Europe. So why did the British go back to Bahrain then? Well, again, you got a historical thing. I, mean, I have an ex- you know. Well, again, they're small. There are certain things they can do, but I, I wouldn't. You know, Bahrain's a, a place where you can have an impact with a rather, rather manageable yeah. uh, investment, and Saudis and others, Americans and others are there. But so it's it that that's but that's not Syria, that's right. not Iraq, that's right. not Yemen. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the the the, by and, uh, the the difference of scale is is, is fundamental. That's fair. Last question, Richard. Uh, as you know, almost every administration has had to deal with a surprise in the Middle East. What kind of a surprise do you expect over the next few months and perhaps years? Well, Bilal, if I could tell you, it wouldn't be a surprise. That very uh, true. So that's the uh, look. I can imagine the most likely things. I don't know if it's a surprise or not. It depends on the quality of your imagination. You would think continued nuclear advance inside Iran not a surprise so much as, but some would say, you know, it would would clearly be Iran running a risk. I think there's the surprise of how local states might react to it. I think there's uh, the surprise of Iranian or Iranian back forces attacks on American soldiers or shipping or something like that. One can imagine an assassination attempt uh, or successful one somewhere in the region, instability in Jordan, instability in Egypt. You mentioned Libya, I mean, Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, look, it's the Middle East. Yeah. The Middle East was, is, and for the foreseeable future will be the least stable part of the world. You have none of the, or few of the prerequisites of stability or order in this part of the world. You don't have a, you have, rather than a balance of power, you have multiple imbalances of power. In right. many cases, you have a inadequate diplomacy, uh, terrible readings of the other side's capabilities and more important uh, intentions. You have weak governments and you have some relatively strong governments. Uh, there, there's so many fault lines in sure. the in the region and there's no overall sense to use a Kissingerian notion. Uh, not only don't you have balances of power in many cases, but you don't have any sense of legitimacy. There's no shared understanding of what the regional order lo- ought to look like. So as long as that's the case, I think you have to, to use your question, is that you have to expect surprise. And so it's yeah. not really a surprise, but you have to expect periodic eruptions of instability because that's what the Middle East is. To me, the, the scariest one, though, is the one we began with, which is the one that you add a nuclear dimension or a move towards the nuclear dimension where Iran begins to get closer and then other countries decide that they have to start hedging against that. And they start moving in those directions. And just when you think the Middle East couldn't get worse, it could get a lot worse real fast if that sort of a dynamic took hold. And the irony for this administration or tragedy is the entire strategic preference, I'd call it, of this administration is to dial down or certainly not dial up its involvement in this part of the world. Want to focus on the Indo-Pacific and all that. And the question is, Godfather, like whether the Middle East lets you or whether the Middle East pulls you back in. And I think that's going to be for this administration and for future administrations. How do you deal with the fact that you'd prefer your strategic resources to be focused elsewhere to a large extent? Can Will the Middle East let you do that? And can you decide what's 
can you avoid either too much or too little involvement in this part of the world? Can you, can you find your right size Goldilocks answer to the Middle East? And I think that's the challenge for the Biden administration, but also for, for administrations to come. Okay. Richard, uh, it is two o'clock. I don't want to abuse more of your time. Um, I want to thank you very much for this really rich conversation. I, I know your time is very busy. Uh, you are most welcome uh, whenever you want to continue this conversation. Um, I'm Thanks, not going to leave you before you give me a prediction on the, the New York Giants for this season. What do you, what do you expect from them? Oh, they'll be better than 500. They're not, they're not Super Bowl material, but they're playoff material and better than 500. Just watch. I think, you know, 10 and 6, 9 and 7. I feel good about it. Fair enough. Okay. Some pretty solid free agent pickups. All right. Thank yeah. you, my friend. <laughs> Take care. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.